Hi, I'm Risa Morimoto and welcome to The Modern Age, where we chat about changing the way we think about aging and caregiving in order to create a life full of choice, comfort, and dignity in our later years. My family and I have been caregivers to our parents for over 17 years. We've been in and out of hospitals on numerous occasions, and whenever I'm there, it just feels like a complex maze of people, paperwork, and bureaucracy. It drives me crazy. Today's guest is Dr. Heather Sung. Dr. Sung was a hospitalist at Danbury Hospital in Connecticut for 14 years, and now she practices palliative care. She received her medical degree at the University of Connecticut and completed her residency in internal medicine at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. She's, uh, she's taught medicine at a number of universities, including Harvard and University of Vermont. Dr. Sung has a particular commitment and really deep interest in humanism in medicine. We had an awesome discussion about the ways in which we can ease the stress and the best ways to advocate for ourselves and our loved ones in the event you need to go to the hospital. So, thank you, Heather. I just wanted to know a little bit about what you do. Um, if you could tell me a little bit about yourself um, and how you became to become a hospitalist. Okay. So um, I started off after residency in primary care, which I loved, um, and I did that in um, Massachusetts in Boston area for four years, and then I decided to have my first child, um, and I felt like I couldn't do primary care well part-time, and I knew that I wanted to be part-time so that I could be there for my children. Um, and so as a hospitalist, um, the continuity in terms of over long spans of time is is not as important. Your your patients most on average are in the hospital for, you know, four days or so. So I felt like it was the best job to do in terms of being part time and and being more shift like when your day's done, your day's done. Right. Yeah. So can you explain to me what is a hospitalist? So hospitalist is. Um, um, for me, it was internal medicine, taking care of adult patients in the hospital only, so no outpatient care. Um, and because medicine has become so complex, um, a lot of primary care physicians will use hospitalists now to manage their patients when they're admitted to the hospital. How would you say the relationship is between, say, a hospitalist yeah. and then all the staff within the hospital yeah. itself? Yeah. And then how does that hospitalist then I'm assuming it has to coordinate with PCP, yeah, right? Yeah, so I had mixed feelings as a hospitalist because I, um, what, what was so important to me in primary care was the relationship with my patients. So if it, when the patient comes into the hospital, most systems, um, you know, there, there's differences in different hospitals, but there, there would be some form of notification to the primary care physician and, um, there now with the electronic medical records, it's it's helpful because oftentimes the hospitalist can access that and see what's been going on with the patient, and also get access to their list of medications, which is very important. Um, and then, um, can you get that like right away? Because sometimes they're coming in through the ER. Yeah, right? and you have to make yeah. A lot of a lot of times patients will have you know, we try to teach people to bring their lists with them, to create a list of their medicines and bring them with them, but now with the electronic health records, a lot of times the pharmacies are integrated into that, so you can see what prescriptions were last filled, um, so you get a sense of the medicines. Um, and then the primary care physician, once they receive notification that their patient is admitted, the office will typically, um, you know, fax over some basic information um, to the medical team. Um, and then during the course of the hospitalization, there's not often communication with the primary care physician unless there's some specific, you know, significant event or um, some important um, in information that might be um, necessary in conducting a family meeting or that type of thing um, where there may be some conflicts or interpersonal issues that that the uh, hospitalist should know about. Um, they might call the primary care physician. Um, and then at the end, upon discharge, there often is a phone call to the office saying that your patient has been discharged and then the primary care physician will receive the discharge summary of the hospital course. But um, 
So you never at any time really consult with the PCP? Oftentimes not, not necessarily. Or any of the specialists? The specialists will often be seeing their patients in the hospital. So like the cardiologist or a neurologist or pulmonologist, either the one that directly has the relationship with the patient or whoever their partner might be who's on, on service at that time. Um, so you're talking about a hospital cardiologist or you're talking about um, their private cardiologist? Yeah, so it, it, differs, it differs per it's different so systems. <laughs> yeah, it's, it differs in different regions. Like for the hospitals that I worked for, which was um, when I did primary care was Mass General and then um, he, um, more recently it was in Connecticut, it was Danbury Hospital and then Norwalk Hospital. Um, the, there are, um, there might be sort of a, a specialist group that is a part of that system um, and, um, and then there might be a private group and so it depends upon who the patient has had, whether it was the hospital-based group or the private group. Um, and so the hospital-based group will typically have one, um, one physician who's on service, they call it, who would be taking care of all the inpatient consults and rounding on um, the patients that are cared for by that practice. Mm -hmm. um, the private group might sometimes, that person, that individual who has that relationship with patient may, may, may see that patient alone or they might have one of their colleagues see that patient. Yeah. Wow. So, but the primary care physicians don't typically come in. I think, unfortunately, the hospitalists um, as a field developed f in part because medicine has become so compl complex, so outpatient care and inpatient care are very, very different. And, it, it, and there's so much advancements in medicine to know how to treat a patient with acute hospital conditions. Um, to know all that and to know how to care for them in the outpatient setting, it, they're very different. And mm -hmm. so, so how would you say they're different? So say someone comes in yeah. with, you know, a stroke. Yeah, so procedures-wise, you know, um, uh, medication treatments, the, the, um, there's so many advancements in, in medicines and what we typically use in the hospital are, more, are most often intravenous. So, um, right. yeah, so there's, and, um, and then things happen much more acutely and to know what diagnostic tests to do at that point in time for that particular condition. Um, it's a pace that's very different than in the outpatient setting. So, and things happen quickly. So if you're in the office and you are seeing patients and your patient in the hospital suddenly has an acute change, goes into respiratory distress or something like that, you can't get there and that's very stressful. Right. So that's where I think you really almost have to have that system in place um, now. Yeah, it's hard because you as a primary care physician have had that relationship with your patient and now you've missed a big important chunk of their time, something very acute, something very stressful to them and their family. Um, and um, perhaps you might not find that the hospital is as, is, is as emotionally involved because they don't have that relationship with right. the patient. I mean, often, I mean, my experience with hospitals has been pretty abysmal. Yeah. You know, you just feel like you're a number in a lot of places. Yeah. Of times. Yeah. It's yeah. the pace is fast. There's so many people coming in and out of the room. You may see someone one day and then see someone the next day. People don't introduce themselves well. You don't know who the right. person is to, to ask all the questions to. Like, I think the, the there's ongoing efforts to try to improve that. Like some places will use the whiteboard, like every patient room might have a whiteboard and you write down who the attending physician is, what's their contact number, who the resident is, because a lot of hospitals are teaching hospitals, so who is the resident, who tend to be there more often than the attending is. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know if that is an experience that you had in, in the hospital. Well, they told us, like when our parents, when my mom was in the hospital and then when my dad was in the hospital, like it was really hard to navigate because it felt I felt like there were just so many different people coming mm -hmm. in, whether it was the social worker or mm -hmm. the nurse, you know, the attending, or mm -hmm. then there was a specialist that would come in, or, you know, yeah. And so, who would you recommend? Mm -hmm. um, 
that families, <clears throat> depending, I yep. mean, of course it depends on what ailment, why they're in the mm -hmm. hospital, but like structurally, if you can describe mm -hmm. kind of structurally who all the players are mm -hmm. in a hospital yep. when caring for a patient, yep. and then how should families communicate mm -hmm. to whoever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think to break them, break it apart just because there's, um, um, it depends on if your if your patient is admitted onto a surgical service or into a medical service. Um, <clears throat> if they're admitted onto a medical service, including let's say the intensive care unit, um, there um, the intensive care unit would um, typically have an intensivist who's often a pulmonologist trained, um, and they would be the attending for that patient while they're in the ICU. On the floors, the non-ICU in intensive care unit, um, then the attending would be typically the hospitalist. Um, so um, the hospitalist would be the person that you would go to for most of your complex questions. Um, if you really want all the information, that would be who you go to, or the intensivist if your loved one is in the intensive care unit. But who's there more often on a regular basis. If it's a teaching hospital, it might be the residents. So there's a team. So it's the attending as the, the head, then there's the resident who's the upper le level training, um, and then there's the intern who's the first year. Um, um, so after medical school, there's residency in internal medicine. There's typically three years for internal medicine, so the first year, and then the resident is the second or third year. Um, yeah. And what about the nurse and the social worker? So the nurse can give you sort of the basic information of how is my mom doing today? How does she look? Is she, you know, eating? Were there any issues overnight? Um, and and also if the nurse was present on rounds, um, can sort of give you an update. Oh, that you you know your mom's gonna have a CAT scan today, um, um, or your mom's back from CAT scan. So it's not like. The resident and the hospitalist are communicating with the nurse to give them updates or anything like that. You do, um, you do if it's going to be some some tests, you know, involved, um, or if you're starting a new medication. Um, they a lot of times the nurse will try to be present on rounds, or a lot of times um, there's a scheduled time for rounds on the floor, and the nurse will try to be present. But if they're caught up with other activities, there's also oftentimes a nurse interdisciplinary round. Um, I know um, in Norwalk Hospital, where I was most recently, that that rounds would be attended by each team would you know have a turn um, to be present to go through their patients. The social worker case manager would be present and the nurses and also the therapists. And you would talk about each patient. And, and, You're and talking about physical therapy. And yeah, and physical therapy, and occupational and therapy, speech therapy. Um, those rounds would often be more on talking about disposition. So, you know, um, thinking about discharge planning, anticipating the needs of the patient upon discharge, that type of thing. And, and what role does the social worker play? The, um, so social workers will often be the case manager, um, but case managers could be social workers or nurses. Um, they will typically help with the disposition issues relating to the patient. So discharge what do you mean by disposition, discharge planning, um, what are the needs for the patient upon completion of their hospital stay? Are they safe to go home? Do they need extra support? Do they need visiting nurse services? Um, they might address some of the insurance related issues to getting set up with services or going to um, a rehab facility. And they will also do some supportive therapy to um, families and, and patients. So, for example, in the intensive care unit, um, the social worker may be very involved in, in some of the um, meetings that might be had to discuss goals of care relating to the patient who um, is going through some very significant issues, life and death. and and emotional issues for the family, the social worker can help with that. So how often do you find like <clears throat> um, families are prepared with the paperwork? So like, well, you know, we've been caregivers for 
quite a number of years. Yeah. So now we kind of know what yeah. we should be bringing into the hospital yeah. when we have to go. Yeah. You know, whether it's the health proxy yeah. and the DNR, it's like all the paperwork yeah. stuff, right? All the meds and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So um, being that you worked within the hospital yeah. system, what do you, how do you recommend families be best prepared yeah. so that when, you know, mom and dad or whoever mm -hmm. um, needs to go into the hospital? Mm -hmm. For me as a physician, it's it's helpful to have the medication list. That's like the, one of the most important things for me because looking at the medication list often tells me what their conditions are. Um, if they are traveling or, or new to the hospital system, any other records that they might have. Um, again, if they're in the, the same region as where they're hospitalized, a lot of um, the primary care offices have an integrated electronic medical record now with the hospital system, so that's helpful. The advanced directives, um, so the advanced directives may be, um, so people sometimes don't know what the advanced directive is. The advanced directive has two components. It has the living will um, or the uh, um, healthcare power of attorney. Um, and the living will is the, it will typically be fairly generic and state if my condition is terminal, I do or do not want to be intubated, I do or do not want to have cardiac resuscitation, I do or do not want to have artificial nutrition, hydration. Um, so that's one part of the advanced directive. The other part is if they've designated healthcare power of attorney or um, a healthcare agent. So if I do not have capacity to make medical decisions, I designate so and so to be my healthcare decision maker. Um, and you could have a secondary as well. The advanced directive, a lot of people think, needs to be completed by a lawyer, and it does not. Um, it um, can be completed in by the physician, and it just needs to have a witness. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So in the like hospital, like you mean your PCP or by yeah the, the PCP, and the, and then maybe their nurse could witness completion of that. I don't know if that's state rules though, um, so I, I I'd have to double check that. But but it doesn't al it doesn't always have to be completed by a lawyer. So sometimes people say, oh, I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't complete that, and that's not necessary. So say you have a heart attack and you're mm -hmm. in the ER, mm -hmm. can you say, I want to do a living will right this second? <laughs> well, the hard part about the living will, what I don't like about it is, is how do you define terminal? Right. So if you walked into the hospital, you might have a living will that says, if I'm terminal, I do not want to be resuscitated. My living will says that. But if I walk into the hospital and I have a heart attack, I would want to be resuscitated because how I was just that minute before that heart attack, I was fully alive and, ter and not terminal. I want, to, I want you to try to bring me back again. So yeah. that's different, you know, and I think that's the hard part is, is it's, it's, it, when you talk about such conditions as dementia, how do you define when dementia is terminal, you know? So it's, it's, a, it's a little hard to interpret that, and that's where the healthcare power of attorney, I think, is really helpful because hopefully that person that you designate as your healthcare power of attorney will have a really good understanding of who you are as a person, what's important to you. If I have this event and my outlook looks like this, would I want to live that life? You know, so um, I think that more important than the living will sometimes is, is that healthcare power of attorney. And, and so when you complete a living will, it's really important to have a conversation with it's just not not just completing that living will but talk about it what does that mean so what happens if someone comes into the hospital without a living will without any kind of advanced directives mm -hmm. and can't and can't make decisions for right. themselves so then you look for the next of kin um, and um, the next of kin um, typically would fall to the spouse um, and then if that the spouse is not available or unable to make decisions, then it's the children. Wow. So would you say it's much more important to have that paperwork? I feel like a lot of people don't have that paperwork, mm -hmm. right? I, you're people right. I think there's the, the uh, it, it, there's some percentage of, like in Connecticut, I think like 20% of people have advanced directives completed. And it seems like it's a simple thing. You can get the forms online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just need to get it notarized mm -hmm. or... No, you don't even need to get it... Again, from, for Connecticut, you don't need to get it notarized. Oh, you just need a yeah. witness? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it just simply allows whoever is going to care for you to know what they, what they should and should not do. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I think it's helpful because 
within families who are very, very loving, you know, no, n not dysfunctional, um, there's differences in how you want things to be done. Everyone has their own relationship with their mother or father. Each child has a different kind of relationship, and each person processes things differently. And so, it's it, even when the families are very united, there's often some degree of conflict or disagreement. And yeah, I mean, I would say that even within my own family, like when my mom had her stroke, it was just really, you know, my sister was almost irrationally upset, mm -hmm. you know, um, that she couldn't, it was clear that she could not make any decisions. Mm -hmm. I kind of get into more of the mode of, mm -hmm. you know, what do we have to do mm -hmm. um, to kind of get through this. And my brother was actually out in Colorado, so we had to wait for him to come in. Um, I just feel like, you know, when you go into a hospital or an emergency mm -hmm. room or whatever, the emotions are so heightened. Mm -hmm. It's not the time to want to make any kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like that. Right. You know, you just right. don't feel... Right, and your decisions might be guided by fear at that point. Right. You know, yeah, um, yes. You know, I, I tell people that I know, you know, make sure you have your parents yeah. or your spouse or whoever. Yeah yourself yeah. has the advanced directives. Yeah. So what would you say at minimum people should have? So, you know, I, I, I think it's important to have designated a healthcare agent, someone who, and that person, I sometimes tell patients as well that it, it's sometimes not the person that you are closest to or that you love so much because that person might have a really hard time making decisions. They're too close, they can't separate their emotions. Um, from what you might want in that situation. So that's important for people to know. Um, sometimes it might be not a family member, it might be a friend. And so I find that very helpful, but I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm in, a, in palliative care where those kinds of conversations and decisions come up more frequently. Right. Um, so once a patient is discharged, yeah. Basically, you never see the hospitalist again. Correct? You know, unless you, you know, are someone who we call frequent flyer who comes in frequently. <laughs> They're really called frequent flyers? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, who has, you know, a chronic um, condition that's probably progressing. May We see patients who, you know, everybody, all the attending hospitalists might know because they come in so frequently. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. And um, they may, may end up almost know the hospitalists more than they know their primary care physicians because there are some patients who get sick every month, you know, coming in to the hospital with, let's say, congestive heart failure or chronic obstructive lung disease with exacerbations frequently, like every month, and they never even make it to get to their primary care between their hospitalizations sometimes. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So you mentioned how medicine has become very complicated. Yeah. You know, being hospitalized is yeah. becoming complicated. And yeah. you have then you have all these layers of insurance. Yeah. And just how do we and you know, everything is so much based on time and yeah. money yeah. and you know, how long you can see a patient. Mm -hmm. How do you think we can kind of create a better healing environment? for well, people who need the care. In the inpatient or in the outpatient? In the inpatient. In the inpatient setting. I think, um, so in, in the inpatient setting, as a hospitalist, you, you, it's not that you have a specific amount of time only to spend with patients, but you have a certain number of patients that you, depending on how busy the hospital is, that you need to see in the course of the day. And you may have two or three patients who are really not doing well at the same time. So you're running from room to room, you know, trying to manage those things. I think what we forget though in that process is that sometimes you can accomplish more, get more information by listening. Um, and that I think we don't do a good enough job with. Um, they've done studies for example, in the intensive care unit where had comp family conferences in, um, been involved more time spent listening to the family members um, as opposed to telling that the course of that 
that care of that patient may have been more efficient, um, achieved the goals quicker. So I think that's important. I think just um, you know finding mechanisms for where family members and patients know better who is the primary doctor caring for them, who's the point person that they can answer questions, that can answer questions for them. Um, explaining when you go into the patient's room what you're going to do as opposed to, oftentimes we'll have conversations amongst ourselves, physician to physician or physician to nurse and mm -hmm. case manager, but not end up going back and sharing that with the patient or their family. We forget. It happens all the time, you know, and so I think we have to be more attentive to that. So how can family members Advocate. You know, be more, yeah, advocate yeah. properly and yeah. effectively where yeah. you're not pissing off. The, yeah. You know what I mean? Because that happens yes. too, you know, because they're yeah. so busy. Yeah. And then I know, I've seen it where yeah. people get reserved and yeah. they don't want to ask the questions yeah. because they feel like they yeah. don't want to bother anybody. Yeah. But at yeah. the same time, then, yeah. you know, it's at the cost of who's in the, you know, the yeah. patient. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, having a point person. Um, of the, in the family, so it's hard when you have one family member calling and you're sharing all that information to them and then you get a phone call again later in the day from a different family and you're sharing all of that. So having one designated point person to kind of do the uh, medical, you know, um, um, be the medical liaison is helpful. Um, I think um, um, maybe sort of um, coming prepared with your questions you feel pressured for time, you are, um, there's so much going on, the physician might be distracted. Um, so I, I, I actually appreciate having the questions written down. And you may think of something later on in the day, it may not be urgent that you ask that question right then and there, but the next morning when you have that opportunity to around to, to, with the physician to, to have those questions. So I think that's, that's helpful. And having you know, um, having the information brought with you to the hospital that, like the medicines and any recent testing or physician evaluations or um, um, advanced advanced directives, those kinds of things. Yeah, that's great. But but patient but patients and families should not feel afraid to ask questions. I think that if you get that sense. It's just because of the pressures of time, but it's your right, you know, so you should not be intimidated by that. Actually, so just, do you ever find that, um, you know, as a hospitalist who's dealing with kind of critical yeah. care issues, yeah. that patients ever want like a second opinion? Like, do you ever yeah. bring in another hospitalist or you bring in a specialist um, to? You can't really bring in another hospitalist. You you have, if, if for whatever reason you do not get along with that patient, um, you can, you know, um, you, you and the patient can mutually agree to transfer over to a different hospitalist. Um, It's very infrequently related to the care that's being given, but more of interpersonal issues. But what if yeah. you just want a second opinion? Yeah, so if you want a second opinion, that, can, that happens sometimes with, um, with um, uh, specialists. You, know, um, you may want a second surgical opinion, or you, want, you may want uh, a different oncologist. You have that right as a, as a patient to request that. Um, but it's it's it, you can't really it's really hard you, you it's really hard to have another hospitalist be involved in your care because you can't really have two attendings. But you can bring in you can then call it you can you can bring in a, a spe another specialist. Yeah, um, I have had patients sometimes um, you know be unhappy or the family members unhappy with care, um, and then I might have like. Uh, the head of the hospitalist come talk to the patient, but you, they're not caring specifically, but come talk um, about what the issues might be and, and try to work through them. F families um, should always feel that they can ask questions even if they feel that they're pressuring or bothering the physician. That, that happens and that's only because the physician is so pressured by time, but it's your right. It's your right to, to, to ask that and to know. This is, 
your loved one and that is your right. Um, it, um, in terms of asking for a second opinion, you also have that right. Um, so you, if you want to get a second opinion relating to the management of your heart condition or your, your cancer treatment or whether you need surgery or you don't need surgery, yes, you can get a second opinion. But it's hard to ask for a different, um, if you're asking for a different attending, you can do that. But you have to completely, like once you make that decision, you switch to the other uh, hospitalist. Oh. You can't like ha say, oh, I like that hospitalist, but I still want you, you know, like it's, right, right, it's, right. it's hard to do that. Right, right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. So is there anything, you know, to wrap things up, mm -hmm. is there anything kind of advice wise or tips people should know before to create a better, smoother hospital experience? Well, I think that it, I, I, I think maybe share with me what your what was so hard f for you in your experiences with your, your uh, parent, and then well, I, I do to... feel like I felt like the discharge process, mm -hmm. like going into the hospital, was fine. Mm -hmm. It was once, and I'm thinking about the most recent experience mm -hmm. with my dad, mm -hmm. um, but. I really felt like we were rushed. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that had to do with insurance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, because it had to mm -hmm. do with the lack of beds. Yeah. And that we, and that, like, literally, they told us at like 11 yep. o'clock that he had to be up by 3 o'clock. Okay. You know, type of thing. And yeah. I'm like, what? So you didn't know the day before that there was No, there was a possibility. Mm -hmm. But, and we were like, well, where mm -hmm. is he going to go? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, because mm -hmm. he had dementia and yep. he was, he was also being belligerent. So it was yep. like a whole yep. slew of yep. issues. It yep. wasn't, you know. Yeah. And, so, because he, he couldn't, so he couldn't come home because mm -hmm. my mom is sick. Mm -hmm. um, so we really struggled with mm -hmm. figuring out like where he was going to go, mm -hmm. and then we had to put our foot down mm -hmm. and say, "No, mm -hmm. you have to find a place for him to go." Mm -hmm. um, and if we didn't push back, mm -hmm. I think I guess we just would have had to take him home. But it just would have created a whole other set of yeah. issues. And then also, I feel like once he's discharged, or once anyone's discharged. There's this gap mm -hmm. of where they don't really prepare you yeah. of what you need to do yeah. once, you yeah. know, it's not like they're healthy and yeah. they're like back on their yeah. feet 100% yeah. once, they, once they get home. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the discharge and the transitions of care are, are, transitions of care, whether it's being admitted into the hospital or discharged from the hospital or being um, discharged from the hospital and going to a nursing facility or going home or going from the nursing facility home, all those transitions are very stressful. And so I think maybe to understand what are the pressures that each person is, is dealing with. So from the standpoint of the hospital, it's not the beds. Yeah, there might be a limited bed, but as long as patient needs criteria for being in the hospital, you, you can't kick someone out. Um, but, what, um, but there are specific criteria for being, remaining in the hospital for treatment. Not having a safe discharge plan you can't discharge someone unless they have a safe discharge plan, but how do you prepare families better to be able to um, create a, a safe discharge plan is important. And so we, we try to um, an, um, anticipate, you know, at least 24 hours in advance and prepare maybe the families within at least a couple days in advance, if possible, that things are looking like um, we're anticipating a discharge on this day so that they can make the, the proper plans. They need to be safe at home. So if your father was going to be discharged discharge home and there's no one to care for him and he was confused and he was belligerent and he was at risk of falling, that would be upon their shoulders if they discharged him in, in a safe, unsafe manner. Um, so that's where the case manager is helpful. So maybe establishing a relationship with the case manager early on, you know, right at the time of admission, if possible, kind of if if you know that the the environment that your loved one was in before this illness was less than perfect, and that there are certain needs and concerns that you have because he's only going to be more frail right. after leaving the hospital. Right. So so letting them know, I, my mom is um, my dad, my mom both have health conditions. My mom, you know, has some dementia. We don't have 24-hour care in place. Um, my sister and I are going, trying to work on that, but, um, you know, do you have, let them know so they can guide you. Is there um, a home health agency that you prefer? Is there an agency that can provide um, 
um, like a 24-hour um, coverage for caregiver? Um, is there financial issues that need to be addressed? Um, would you want to go to a nursing facility? What nursing facility would you prefer? Because then there has to be a bed available in the nursing facility, so you want to create that list you know, earlier so that the nursing facility can... Um, so these are the questions that the family member should ask the case Well, workers, I think the, case, the family the member should... Um, if, there's, if the environment at home um, was fragile before the illness, I think it would be really good to have a conversation right at the start right. with the case manager um, because that environment will only be more fragile. And if the case manager only knows that the day before the medical team plans to discharge the patient, then it is going to be right. a rush and it may be suboptimal um, and a lot of burden upon you as opposed to being able to prepare ahead of time. Right. You know, maybe look at some facilities beforehand. Like, if you had had the opportunity to know that he wasn't going to be safe going home, or that they're planning this, then you might have looked at a few facilities to see which one do I prefer. It would have made you feel much more comfortable, right. perhaps. Or an agency started making the phone calls, developing a level of confidence. I like that agency. I feel like they're going to really provide good care to my, you know, um, right. father. Right. Make make the home environment safe you know, move furniture if necessary, you know, like right, things right. like that, or right. w figure out your work schedule. You know, I'm, I'm going to postpone that trip because I need to be here, you right. know. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, it's a whole yeah. slew of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then home health agencies are always a whole other topic that yeah. I feel like needs a lot of help. And Yes, and then I also think that um, the, I, the, the, tr the transitions of care, um, the um, the passage of information is less than perfect. Mm -hmm. So from from um, physicians to physicians. So is there um, something that family members can do to ensure that that actually happens? So you know, I I I always I put together like a medical file for my my parents. Um, it's easier for me to do that just because I I I know the medical information. Um, so if you can get you know, you will always be sent home with a discharge paperwork, which will say the diagnosis, and it will have the list of medications. And um, so you, you, everybody has that. Um, but if you can get a copy of the discharge summary, that often you can't get the first day because it may not be dictated yet. But within the next, you know, few days, there should be a dictated discharge summary. Mm -hmm. um, just keep a file, even if you don't have that ready for when you're father follows up the next visit you just keep it in a file and you know so that that whole history can be kept together right yeah that's great yeah and then you know in that file you can have your advanced directives your list of medications the home health agency that you use um, all the numbers of the doctors that are involved in his care that, that's that's like a gift for the the doctors who are caring for, mm -hmm. for the patient that's awesome yeah Thank you so much, Heather. You're this welcome. This really, really helpful. <laughs> You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. I hope you were able to find a few valuable tips on how to handle a hospital stay. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family, and I'd love for you to subscribe so you'd know when the new shows are uploaded. What would you say is the single biggest takeaway from our conversation? Leave a comment below. And let us know or contact us on Instagram or Facebook at This Is Modern Aging. The best way to keep in the loop about our latest episodes and other upcoming events is to sign up to our email list at modernage.tv. You can also get a transcription of today's conversation on our website so you want to refer to in the future. We want you to live a life full of choice, comfort, and dignity. We all deserve that. We can't avoid growing older, so we shouldn't avoid the necessary discussions about it either. Thank you so much for watching, and we look forward to seeing you again on The Modern Age.